Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleague Van Salos, dear Academy, dear guests, I would like you, I li would like you um, to welcome here cordially in the festive hall of the Austrian Academy of Science um, the few members of the Academy, it could be more, we have more members, but not everyone is here. Um, uh, this, the researchers of the Academy, uh, the students admitted to the Österreichische Studienstiftung, um, the representatives of other research institutions, um, and maybe some representatives of the industry. Um, I hope you feel fine and will enjoy this joint Academy Day. Uh, I think it's a really interesting um, topic. We will have a keynote. Uh, and, and panel discussion, um, followed by an open and answer session, and then we have a coffee break to get in touch to each other. What is a joint academy day? Since 2018, um, the Austrian Academy of Sciences has been organized a so-called joint academy day together with one or more um, scientific academies abroad. The idea is clear, the Academy, both the Learn Society, the Gelehrtengesellschaft, as well as the uh, research institutes, they, they should strengthen contacts with friendly and competent academies. We want to strengthen the context due to talks, discussions, and personal exchange um, of ideas focused on a very specific um, theme or topic. We accompany this Joint Academy Day with several press releases. We have now had an, an interview. Um, and in the last time, we, we, um, we wrote a memorandum, an open paper on the rules of political advice. Maybe you remember this was happened with the Leopoldina together. Today and for the first time, the Joint Academy Day is with an Academy Alliance. Um, the European Academy Science Advisory Council, um, ESEC. ESEC is an association of the National Academies of Sciences um, of the EU member states, um, including Norway, UK, and Switzerland. Its aim is to provide scientific advice to policymakers um, of the European Union on specific topics in particular topics dealing with environment, energy, public health, and agriculture. I'm sure that President van Sarlos will tell us a little bit more about IRSEC um, later. Apropos Wim van Sarlos, uh, in 2018, the first Joint Academy Day took place together with the Royal Netherlands um, Academy of Sciences under the presidency of Wim van Sarlos and today, uh, the next one, this, um, it's the second time um, to be here as a president, but now as a president of IRSEC. Um, your visit um, in Vienna also marks a starting point for a stronger cooperation between the Akademie the, um, der Wissenschaften, the ÖAW, and IRSEC. The ÖAW will take over the IRSEC secretary, um, which has been hosted by the Leopoldina for the last 12 years, from January 24 onwards. Um, Georg Berveniku Brunner will be the execu executive director, assisted by Andrea Windecker. And our secretary, we will support you, we will support ISEC in the best way to realize its mission and to produce and disseminate your high-level reports. I can assure you that the ÖAW is committed um, and will be a re reliable partner for ESEC's scientific-based policy advice. Now back to the Joint Academy Day. We, 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 we quickly agreed that we make it together and then we thought about the topic and the issue and it was not um, far away to say sustainable energy solutions. That's a highly topical issue not only for both institutions, but also for Europe um, and maybe the whole world. Um, and the starting point of this discussion um, was the report Future of Gas. Future of Gas is a report, a, 
um, which has been published in May 2023. And it's an excellent report, well written, um, easy to, to, to read um, and to understand. And it, and it shows in a very systematic way um, the potential of LNG, hydrogen, natural gas, uh, biogas and others. Um, um, I learned a lot, a lot of reading it and it clearly demands that we should stop burning fossil fuels in the medium and long term. Um, the connection between greenhouse gases and the increasing global temperature with the further consequences on climate, biodiversity, agriculture and the quality of life for everyone has been well proven. However, the exit from fossil fuels um, is not an easy task and will, um, will only succeed gradually, step by step. Our society and our economy are based too much on these fossil energy and we were lazy, um, if I say it in such a way, we were lazy uh, for a long time due to the availability of cheap energy. Today the situation is different, the effects of climate change are evident, the average temperature and the extreme weather events are increasing. Um, everyone knows and recognizes this. And the sanctions against Russia have accelerated the process of phasing out of fossil fuels. But we have to do it politically wisely, politisch weise. Um, we have to do it with the population, with the people, and not against them. If this is ignored, then we will see a strengthening of the political fringes that ignore both climate change and the need to do something against it. They are pointing out and saying China should start or India should start, um, but not we. The phase out of fossil heat systems in private households shows, for example, how difficult um, this transformation process could be. The plans for a radical exit had to be replaced by a modified pass in both Germany and Austria. The ban on installing gas and oil heating now affects the new building and not existing one. And that is a sensible regulation if you don't want to lose the people. On the other hand, I'm optimistic and sure that we will have greater success. Industry, the industry is ready and willing to change um, its energy consumption. And that is important because the industry is producing here in Austria 44% um, of, the, of the greenhouse emission gas. Um, if the first, the first is Austria, largest steel producer succeeds in converting its production, um, then at least 5% of the greenhouse um, gas emission can be reduced um, only by transforming two furnaces, zwei Hochöfen in a new energy um, um, uh, consumption way. And if the industry succeeds in producing electric cars that are no more, much more expensive than the traditional diesel um, or benzene cars, then I'm sure the switch to e-mobility um, will happen so quickly. Um, so industry is, a, is for me a, a key point of a successful policy. The following panel, um, headed by the vice president, chairing by her, will certainly also address these themes and the political measurements to manage the energy transition quickly and successfully. Before the panel discussion starts, I would like to ask Wim van Zalos for his greeting words and keynote speech. May I introduce you briefly? Wim van Zalos was born 1955 in Franeker in Friesland which was for a short period in the 16th century under the control of the Habsburger. 
Um, maybe, maybe that's the reason why you feel, I hope so, why you feel fine in the capital of the Habsburg Kingdom. Wim van Salos studied physics and received his PhD in 1982 from the University of Leiden. Then he joined the AT&T Bell Laboratories in the US as a researcher. And, and after uh, around 10 years, he returned to Leiden University as a professor. In 2009, he changed and became director of the National Foundation for Fundamental Research on Matter in the Netherlands which is part of the National Funding Agency. And it seems to me that this is very important to fund and to organize and coordinate the research in physics in the Netherlands. In 2017, um, Wim van Salos returned to the Leiden University as a professor, combining his position um, as vice president and later as president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences until 2020. Now he serves as president of IRSEC. I said it at the beginning. Um, and within IRSEC, he was earlier the chair of the energy program, then vice president, and now um, president. As a, as a matter of form, I, have, I would like to inform you that today's event will be recorded for the YouTube channel of the ÖAV. So think uh, what, you, what you're saying afterwards. Um, that's all for now. President Van Salos, the stage is yours. And I ask you to give your greeting words and your keynote. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Fassmann, for your kind words and for this introduction. And I'm speaking here on behalf of all the people from ESEC. We're here with a delegation of about 12 people, but several people are watching online, uh, to be part of this Joint Academy Day. And for us at ESEC, it really is something very special, not just because um, ESEC is not an academy like you've had most of your Joint Academy Days with other uh, academies or with groups of academies, as you already indicated, ESEC is an organization of academies and it's an important organization, and I will tell you more about that in my uh, keynote, uh, of academies of science in Europe to give science or policy advice. So we don't have a wonderful building like this and we rely on our members like the OEA to support us. Now, in the coming years, the AIW will especially support us, as was already mentioned, with the, the Secretariat. The ESEC is always supported by a Secretariat by, the, um, by one of the members, and actually this year we are lacking a Secretariat, so we're very <laughs> eager to see the, the new Secretariat start here in Vienna as of January 1st. That is one special reason. But Maybe for my personally, indeed, it's also a bit of homecoming because, as was already mentioned by President Fassmann, I was involved in organizing the first Joint Academy Day with the Dutch Academy. And it, it really feels like uh, homecoming a little bit. And maybe now my ambition becomes to be involved in a third Academy Day at some point, but that's for the future. Um, I'll keep my introductory words short, but let me in these trying times with what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in the Middle East with Israel and Gaza. Um, of course, the focus here will be on sustainable energy solutions, but science is also uh, a way to, to, um, to bring people together on the basis of rational arguments and to be involved. And I've actually, throughout my career, Professor Fassmann already sketched my career a little bit, I've often been involved in that. I remember very much how I was as an undergraduate student. I was at CERN in Geneva and remember this was actually long ago during the Cold War, how important it was and how wonderful it was to have scientists from in the group which I was working. There were scientists from seven different countries, including actually at that time uh, Russia and other countries from the uh, Eastern Bloc. And that was really so enlightening. Now, ESEC is, in some sense, also having 
that role of bringing people together for the good of our countries, of our societies. And therefore, I think that that's why I'm so, so happy to be president of ESEC and why I'm so happy to, that we will be supported in the future by the EAW. Now, coming back to my Dutch background, we have a little bit of a complicated combination here too with Austria. You will remember a few years ago, Austria and the Netherlands were part of the Frugal Four. It was never a title I was so proud of, uh, and that's an understatement. Um, and you know these were the countries together with Denmark and, I'm sorry, Miki, um, and, um, and Sweden, who were trying to pay as, as little as possible to Europe. I'm happy to say that in our country the debate about Europe has changed in the last few years dramatically. Our present Prime Minister, who will step down pretty soon after the elections, has really changed his mind and coming from one of the frugal four, maybe the, one of the driving forces, he now knows that he realizes and actually tells that Europe is also about values, about joining forces, and that this is so important to address the, um, the challenges of these times, but also to keep Europe in a proper place and standing in the international arena these days. And I'm so happy, therefore, that nowadays we can be proud of being together between the EAW and ESEC and not being part of the Frugal Four anymore, but looking forward and trying to help humanity by giving science for policy advice. So that's my introduction, but I will continue basically if I now may give my keynote address because I'm, instead of just jumping to sustainable energy solutions right away, um, I would like to first sketch you a little bit about what ESEC does. I'll tell you a bit about the three programs that we're facing and now I'll try to, I, if I could switch, do you hear me on the, yeah, you do, okay. Um, I will tell you about ESEC, how we organized, and then slowly I will move more to the sustainable energy uh, solutions, and in particular to the report that was already mentioned on the future of gas. Okay, so here we are. And now that you know my background, that I've also been involved with the Dutch Academy, um, I've called my, my title Teaming Up uh, through ESEC at the European level. And that reflects that academies like yours, like the EAW and our KNAW in the Netherlands, there's a, a growing eagerness to contribute to Europe and, and to the, the solution of the grand challenges, but that these are things that you can do on a national scale and that you have to team up with the other academies in the countries. That's the background uh, of, of what I want to, to convey and also the background of why I'm so eager to, to work for ESEC these days. Now, you see here the nice folder of, the, um, of today's meeting. If I had designed it, it would have looked a little bit like this because I really, for us at ESEC, it's also a bit of a celebration that we have the start of our secretary as of uh, January. And I cannot stress enough how important that is for us. Now, um, if you look at the academies, they typically are involved in, say, policy advice, but there, it's good to, to, to stress that uh, you can have policy for science advice and science for policy advice. And most academies are involved in particular in policy for science advice. And I was here actually the Vestif Sitzung, Feierliche Sitzung, in May, and again Professor Fassmann was saying how important it is for Austria to invest more in science and research. And of course, I did the same when I was president of our academy. That's a typical role of academies. Uh, you see there a report of the EAW where it's advising on the participation of Austrian scientists in the big research infrastructures. That's typically oriented at a national level, but in an, in an international setting. But in some sense, science for policy advice I'm calling it as re-emerging. I don't quite know the history of the EAW in particular, but most academies in the 19th century were definitely involved in that. Think about eradicating 
poverty, about eradicating illnesses, improving the, the quality of the drinking water and all these things in, in promoting children going to school. It, certainly in our case, the academy was strongly involved in that. And then, and actually there's an interesting example of um, uh, science for policy advice in the Netherlands. Uh, Hendrik Lorenz, the big Nobel Prize winner, the prime theoretical physicist of that time, of around 1900, was actually chairing a committee for eight years in the Netherlands that advised about building the dike. Some of you who know the map of Holland know there's a big dike of 30 kilometers from uh, in the north, connecting two sides. That dike was built or was designed to prevent flooding. And um, Lawrence was, in, was chairing that committee. He did calculations himself about the shape of the dike. If you look at the map, you can even see it from space. It has a little bend at the end. Lawrence said, we need a bend at the end to prevent resonances. He was absolutely right. And uh, it was amazing what he did. He spent a lot of time on it. Einstein, at that time, complained to the Dutch ministers that they had asked Lawrence to do this and was taking, or that the Dutch government was taking his time away from science. So science for policy advice is not new, but in some sense it has, in many cases, become less of an important role for many academies. But now in the last 10, 15 years or so, it's re-emerging if you wish. And that has to do quite often with the grand challenges. Think of climate, uh, health, think of, um, of biodiversity, etc. These type of challenges that we're all facing are global challenges. And at least uh, in, in Europe, we have to address them and team up at the European level. Now, this is why our academies, why ESEC is so important to channel and to work together from the academies towards the European level. And this is what we aim our advice on, the, the, our reports at the EU, the European Parliament, the European Committee. Now, of course, it also goes back, um, and we have to translate what, what is happening or what we advise on the European level also to the national level, because our countries are also different. Here again, ESEC is involved, but I think we can strengthen our presence and our way of operating also on that level. And I hope that actually the, the support from the AOA will help us in, uh, do better in the future. Now, what is ESEC? It's basically the organization of science academies in Europe. Of the 25, most of the member states, Malta and Luxembourg, don't have a science academy there. Um, and the um, Academia Europea, the uh, uh, ALIA, the organization all European academies, and also the Federation of Medical Academies has a strong link with us. We're actually in collaborating with FEM, the Organization of Medical Academies, quite a bit. And so that's it. Now, if you say science academies, Austria and my own country don't have a single science academy, they have a broad academy. That's actually a strength that the OEA and, and our academy are all members of ESEC, because many of these great challenges, uh, of course, also involve more social issues. And so quite often when we give our advice, we also need the input from the scientists or, or say social scientists or, or in other fields. And their academies like the OEA and our Dutch Academy are important in, because they have also their roots in those fields. Now, by the way, ESEC is also called the European Network of IAP. IAP stands for Inter-Academy Partnership. It's a global organization, again, of science and medical academies. And um, it's, it's a bit like a copy of it because ESEC is the European network. IAP also has a network in Asia, in Africa, and in the Americas, actually in North and South America combined. And what they do is, and you'll see that come back in my presentation, often they take work of ESEC and bring it to a global level. I'll come back to that. Now, the easiest way, and actually President Fassmann already mentioned that in his introductory words, to explain ESEC is to say, look, we're focused, we have three programs, one on biosciences and public health, one on energy, and one on environment. And here I'm listing that, that's basically the way you should think about it. That's how we, what we focus on. 
And here you see a number of titles of reports and statements that we have been publishing in the last few years. I'm not going to run you through all of them, but the ones in green I'll come back to in the, in the coming few minutes. Um, now that's in a way what we do, and here's how we do it. And what you see is for each of these programs, we have a program director. That is someone, a paid person, who is working not full-time, but roughly half-time for ESAC. It's a person with experience in, in policy advice and what's happening with a focus on what is happening in Brussels and experience in the particular field we're studying. And this is so important. You remember that Professor Fassmann mentioned that the future of gas was written in a in a very good way to also convey the messages to the policy makers. And that's, of course, where the, these program directors are so important for. And then you see for each of the program, we have a steering panel uh, chaired by typically uh, <coughs> two scientists from various countries. And the steering panel meets twice a year. And it's a standing panel. And um, they discuss what type, type of topics to address in terms of uh, writing a report, etc. And once that's chosen, once it, the topic is decided and approved by council, we form an ad hoc working group that studies that uh, under the direction of the program director, and then we issue the report. I'll show you an example of sort of the timeline associated with that later. Um, by the way, if you're sitting here in the audience in our uh, associated with the EUV, we, we have two vacancies, as you can see, on the biosciences panel and on the environment panel. So please come up to us uh, if you're eager to, to join us. Now, the important point is that this, all of this here below that I've encircled is really basically done by the academies. It's the scientists, the experts in Europe that we bring together in the steering panel and in the working groups. And Indeed, so that's 100% by the academies and for the academies. And what is crucial is it's independent and bottom-up. It's that we decide or our steering panels discuss, that the scientists that are nominated, that they are the representatives by the academies, they decide what they want to study and what is a good topic to study. That's non-trivial because you, in some sense, have to to also look ahead what is going to be important in Europe, what are the developments, what kind of legislation might come up that we could actually give input on. But it's independent and bottom-up. And this is actually why our work is often so well received, because people know it's not ordered, it's not paid for by, by an external organization. It's what our scientists think is so important. And then on the right, I've indicated again the crucial role of the the program directors as the intermediates between what is happening in Brussels with an eye on that and the continuity. The continuity is also important. You'll see many of these, it's not like we write a report and we, we publish it and then we go on. Many of these things, these issues, of course, climate and energy, these are long-term issues. Many of these issues come back later on and the politicians ask advice and typically from the program directors or what have you done before, could you explain this to us? Uh, and sometimes we follow up with reports. You'll also see examples of that in the rest of my presentation. You might ask, hey, why don't you have climate in there? Well, climate is, is actually play, paying an important role in the work we're doing. And actually, if you realize that there's an energy issue, I mean, if you want to mitigate the climate problem, you have to get more to sustainable energy. Often there is an sort of an... Uh, an a competition between using land or for energy or for using it for, for there's a competition between the biodiversity so uh, climate energy and biodiversity and environment are strongly coupled and finally of course climate change in health is important so climate is not a separate topic but it's actually figuring in in all our three programs and let me illustrate this with the first example from now the Biosciences and Public Health Panel. We wrote a report in 2019, you see it here on the right, on essentially climate change and health. And of course you can never say we were the first, but I think if you look at the, the debate in politics, climate change and health was not so much realized by then how important it is. 
And in this report, we gave a number of recommendations. We asked for uh, <coughs> no evidence. We, we pointed out the vulnerable groups that exist and that will suffer from climate change and health. We asked attention for resilience and adaptations, etc. This was 2019, so you can ima imagine this was the, the topic was identified late 2017. Uh, now, IAP is coming back. This report that we first did in 2019 was followed up actually by this global organization, IAP, and was taken up by the, the Asian, the African, and the American uh, networks following up, building basically on the, the report that we had done, and they wrote their, say, continent-oriented work uh, in the same spirit. And then on the right, with our strong input, there was a global report, a synthesis report on the essence of climate change and health. And I would say because we were one of the first really putting that on the agenda, we've been instrumental in getting that message. And then you see, once you've these reports take a lot of time to make, and the, the, the working groups spend quite a bit of time, but once you've really set that, uh, made a, a very good uh, analysis of what the issues are and where we are, then there's often quite a bit of follow-up work. And for instance, you see, here, you see here some examples. The one in the middle is to get done together with the Federation of Medical Academies. It's on decarbonization of the medical sector. Probably in your country you have similar initiatives these days of just using less plastics and other things in the, uh, in the hospitals. Uh, and the one on the right is basically done with the academies in, around the Mediterranean. Probably you know that the Mediterranean is quite a hotspot for climate change these days. And so we have quite a bit of follow-up work here. And by the way, sometimes these reports even lead to publications in the, in the regular research journals like indicated there. Now, let me give another example in the in from the environmental panel, in this case done together with the energy panel. In 2017, um, we issued a report essentially on the future of European forests. It was actually supported by the Finnish Academy. And the important observation in this report is the following. For a long time, people thought about or, uh, or, or stated that using biomass for energy for power generation was sustainable because, of course, the, the trees regrow and therefore they absorb the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide. Now, that's, that is fine in a steady situation, but if you think in terms of the, the goals of the Paris Agreement, where we have to be carbon neutral by 2050, the time scale for a forest to regrow is of the order of 80 years, and so suddenly this doesn't match anymore. And that was one of the main messages that really changed the insights uh, into using bioenergy uh, through the ESAC work. And again, then there was work to go on the um, using or combining biomass with carbon uh, um, by, uh, by CCS, and uh, we have an, a, some statements on this as well, and a report on negative emission technologies. So again, you see that once you've done such an in-depth study, you can often build on it later on. Now, that's not all we do. And on the left, you see a report on regenerative agriculture, which is a if you wish, a, a different way of doing agriculture, from farm to fork it's often called, and you see that's illustrated on the cover. There's quite a few detailed um, recommendations, but also observations how, if one follows the, the route of farm to fork strategies or regenerative agriculture, you can decrease the amount of pesticides you need, you can decrease the amount of fertilizer, and at the same time also decrease the emission of carbon dioxide. The one on the right is more recent. It's actually from, uh, was published in June of this year on deep sea mining. It's not a full report, it's a statement indicated there. And you see here illustrated that we start to pay also more attention to conveying the message in a simple one pager. Um, this statement has been quite important and in that um, 
uh, there was a there was were attempts by some countries to actually uh, allow for the deep sea mining, but a number of countries basically following. Uh, well, we were at least one of the the organizations that were calling for a moratorium. And just last, year, uh, last week, the UK government actually decided to back the idea of having a moratorium on deep sea mining uh, and were, were, um, were pointing to the importance of the ESEC report in their decision to, uh, to back this, um, uh, this moratorium. Now let me finally come to the, uh, the future of gas and show you a little bit about the energy program. Of course, in Europe, the Green Deal introduced in 2019 is so important, and you see the various um, areas that they have identified. Now, what I was just telling you, the, some of these reports in the other energy or in the other programs already, in some sense, fit very well with some of the areas of the Green Deal. Um, but if you look, for instance, in what we have done on decarbonization of transport and of buildings, that is also identifying several of the areas in the Green Deal. But the one up on the upper right there, on clean, affordable and secure energy, brings us to the future of gas. And here, we, here it is, at least the timeline. I now take a minute to illustrate how we work. You see, the report was published in May of this year, but in 2021, the steering panel discussed this quite extensively and identified this as an important topic. Then it was approved by our council. That was all actually, you might think from the title that we thought of this, this project because of the war in Ukraine, but that started later. The working groups, that's the M1 to M4, the working group was meeting f four times online. That was during the COVID times also. And um, then there was peer review. That's another important part of we're academics. We want to have peer review, so we send out the draft report. And I can tell you this particular topic, which meanwhile, because of the, the, um, the war, had become so sensitive and there was so much uh, attention to it that we had more uh, referee reports and more comments than ever before. And Bill Gillett, who had to deal with all of this, really suffered through it quite a bit. Um, but the report was then released in May of this year. And here you see the cover, together again with a one-pager that shows some of the, uh, the key messages from this report. And in the panel discussion that we'll have later, we'll have both Bill Gillett, the Program Director of Energy, and the two co-chairs of the working group, uh, Anna Neumann and Nevin Duitsch, who will be uh, sitting here on the panel. And um, let me show you one of the messages is actually the following. Um, because of all the, the changes these days, and in particular now that a lot of shale gas is also being used for uh, generating LNG, etc., and uh, methane, one of the warnings is that um, there are a lot of losses or uh, in a lot of losses during the extraction and transport of, uh, of methane, of liquefied natural gas, etc. And methane is an enormous um, global warming or has an enormous greenhouse gas effect. The global warming potential of methane on a time scale of 20 years is, of, is 80 times that of CO2. Methane does appear faster than CO2 from the atmosphere. So after th 30 or 40 years, it's less, but still it's, it's a lot. And if you realize that about 70% of the countries that actually extract and, and that actually deliver the gas to Europe are from countries that are not so careful with their transport, with their extraction, that is, they flare the, the gas, they, they lose some of the gas during transport. That's, in some countries, that's estimated to be of order 3% or so. You suddenly see that if you have 3% loss of a gas that has a global warming potential of 80, you're really having problems. So that is one of the, the things, and we we, monitor, we say that it should be more monitored. We, we back the, the, um, a, um, <coughs> uh, an initiative to reduce the, the amount of methane that escapes. Here's another one <coughs> that I, I didn't know about and that I learned from the report. Some companies are saying, let's mix hydrogen 
with the natural gas and then burn it? Well, apart from the fact that it's quite expensive, uh, if you mix 10% of hydrogen with your natural gas, the amount of CO2 emission that is reduced is only 1%. You really have to go to enormous fractions of hydrogen in order f if you want to reduce the amount of CO2 emission. That's one of the messages. And finally, uh, you see at the upper top a message about um, giving attention to energy poverty. And this illustrates again that even though we are an organization of natural science academies mostly, we do take, try to take into account in what we're doing the insights and contribution from also the social sciences. And indeed the fourth panel mem member who you will see here later on on the floor is uh, Hanna-Lena Payson, who is also the co-chair of our steering group. And her background is e in economics, so actually one of our co-chairs of the steering panel is actually from the social sciences. Now, just very briefly, so here you see some of the recommendations that we had on energy poverty, uh, increasing or basically asking for uh, attention to uh, low-income housing or the, the, the people who will suffer most from, uh, from a or could suffer most from an energy transition and asking attention for that. Here's an interesting map and associated again with some of the recommendations that we, we made. Here's a map of what is called, or the homes that are too cold. You see, here's indicated with color, you see that in Austria and Norway only 2% of the houses are too cold. You're used to that, so your houses are well insulated. But there are countries in Europe where more than 10% of the people are in houses that are supposed to be too cold. We have a number of recommendations in the, um, in the report on uh, well, monitoring things, making m more statistics available, and also on reducing the energy poverty. So we do try to give attention to that. So that's all I, w I do want to say about the Future of Gas report. You'll have the experts here on the floor in a few moments or after the break. And so in summary, what ESEC is doing is giving science for policy advice on these particular topics which I stressed, uh, oriented at the policy-oriented audience, uh, not pri primarily for scientists. We do want to give attention, and I think the OEA will provide a very good a fertile ground for giving more attention also for the communication to the broader public, um, the, to, to make our work available to them. We do this through reports, statements, commentaries, etc. And we do it on a timely manner. And through IAP, this organization, we're even able to bring many of these projects to a global scale. So that's basically um, what I wanted to say and to thank the OEAV for willing to host the academy. You see here the, the new design of your academy building as of January 1st. Um, we're very proud of that, and uh, don't take me serious at this point, but don't worry. Um, but it's, in our way of thinking, it's really these, this academy, this building will be really the central point for ESEC, and we look very much forward to that. Indeed, working together with the AOA and, and, and being supported by here will allow us to also give attention to a number of things, increase the collaboration with other partners, partner organizations at the European level, stronger engagement with the member academies, because your academy is strong in that and has good ties with the other member academies. We want to give more attention to diversity, also including the younger researcher, researchers and also things like gender uh, diversity, more attention to communication, I've already said that, and strengthen our presence in Brussels. And we really think that the OEAV will provide us a wonderful place for the new Secretariat and we're very happy to come here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bim, for your friendly words and, your, and the explanation how ESEC is working. It's not so, so easy for a newcomer to understand everything. The program director, steering, steering panel, ad hoc, uh, topical working group, um, 
and then comes the overall um, council to decide about everything. Thank you very much for, for presenting it. Also, that there is a difference between full report and statements. Um, it was not in my mind so present. Um, science for policy advice, and therefore I think it's, it, was a, it was a wise decision to offer you uh, that we could help and should help as a secretary to the further work of ESEC. Um, science for policy advice is so important. I know from my former um, occupation, the politicians are so hungry um, to, to get advice, to get good advice, quality approved advice, advice which they can use in their, in their um, political daily work. Um, there are people are some skeptic if this is true that the politicians are hungry, but I can say you are surrounded by, 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 by um, uh, Mitarbeiter um, in your cabinet. You have so many topics to handle, so many balls are in the air and every, every ball is to catch up. Um, so you are, you are so thankful if, if, you get, if you get, let's say, a, a, a quality based insight into the different political issues which you handle um, day by day. So I'm, I'm sure and optimistic that there is a lot of do for, for IRSEC and it's, it's also a good decision that you concentrate on different fields, not to make everything um, concentrate on, 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 on different fields which are relevant. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm looking in the same way optimistic. I can promise to you that we will not change our facade. Um, if we would like it, our Bundesdenkmalamt would say, no, that's not uh, allowed. Uh, there is no discussion foreseen now, um, and we are five minutes over time. Um, we, we have now a coffee break of 25 minutes. Um, the coffee break is downstairs in the, in the, in the lobby. Um, and then we come back at 45, um, and, and Ulrike Diebold, you will chair the interesting panel discussion. Thank you very much, Wim, for your um, explanation and your making appetites to the report about gas. Thank you. The Academy, dear guests, uh, welcome from my side as well. My name is Ulrike Diebold and I'm currently the Vice President of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. In my day job, I'm a, a Professor of Surface Physics at TU Wien and also at, on the Board of Directors of one of the excellence clusters that have introduced in Austria uh, recently. Uh, and ours is on materials for energy storage and conversion. So I have not only a personal interest, but I have a professional interest in many aspects on today's topic. Um, climate change and environmental degradation yeah, are existential threats to Europe and the world, and I think arguably the biggest challenge of our time. Um, it was already mentioned, the European Green Deal, which is undoubtedly one of the largest and most important future projects of the European Union. And the European Commission seeks to take a front seat in the global goal for more climate protection and sustainability. The plan is very ambitious. It will induce many changes and it covers numerous, I would say all sections of our life, uh, from industry to energy supply, agriculture, transport and society in all 27 EU member states. So Europe is the first continent that has promised to become carbon neutral by 2050. And along the way, the EU has tightened its emission uh, state targets in the short term. And the EU climate law makes the transition hopefully irreversible and climate neutrality legally binding. And this gives the Green, the Green Deal a concrete direction and a timetable. However, there's many obstacles along the way. For example, there's currently no generally accepted understanding exactly how climate neutrality should be defined. 
And the challenges are really enormous, and the European economy is set to undergo a major transformation. So we have this also ambitious title today, Energy Transition, Realistic Ambitions and Ambitious Perspectives. I think it has it's very important to keep both in mind, what are the perspectives and how we get there. And I'm really, really happy that we have six outstanding scientists with wonderful expertise in all sorts of areas that are very important in its transition. Uh, we will discuss future energy concepts and how the transformation can succeed without losing sight of social compatibility. So I'm very pleased and happy to introduce and I would like you also to come to the podium uh, today's speakers. The first is William Gillett. He's the director of the ISAC Energy Program and the former head of the Unit for Renewable Energy of the European Commission's Executive Agency. Thank you, Will. <laughs> Hanna Lena Pesonen is dean of the Ivers Kühler University School of Business and Economics and professor of corporate environmental management. She is also the co-chair of the ISAC, steering, ISAC Energy Steering Panel. Thank you, Hanna. Georg Brasseur is Professor Emeritus of Electrical Measurement and Sensor Systems at the Graz University of Technology and Scientific Director of NetAir, an Energy Transition Europe Research Association. He serves as President of the Division, he did serve as the President of the Division of Mathematical and Natural Sciences of the UE from 2013 to 2022. Thank you, Georg. Thank you. Kevan Riahi is the director of the Energy, Climate and Environmental Program at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, EASA. He is lead author of the third, fourth, fifth and sixth IPCC assessment reports, member of the EU Advisory Board on Climate Change and co-chair of the Austrian Panel on Climate Change. Thank you, Kevin. Anne Neumann is Professor of Managerial Economics at the Norwegian Institute, University of Science and Technology and the Director of Research of the Norwegian University of the Science and Technology Energy Transition Initiative. She is the co-lead author of the ISAC report, Future of Gas, that has been mentioned several times already. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> and la last but not least, Nevin Duic, is Professor of Power Engineering and Energy Man Management at the University of Zagreb and Vice President of the Croatian Academy of Engineering. He's also co-chair of the ISAC Energy Steering Panel and the Future of Gas Working Group. Thank you, Nevan. Before I start, I don't want her to come to the podium, but I really want to thank her and I want to applaud her, Julia Weile in the back, because she has been instrumental in putting today's program together. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> okay. So, let me start a little bit in setting the stage. Um, gas has been very central in today's discussion already. Anna is holding this wonderful report that Heinz also really liked very much reading and I myself enjoyed it too. Uh, we all know that it's uh, used different in different parts of Europe and since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, gas has been widely, before that, gas has been widely accepted as a transitional role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and power generation and heating. Uh, the war as it has involved has changed a lot amongst that, how we look at gas. And it has become clear that in the short term, Western Europe must not only reduce its consumption of natural gas, but in order to ensure security for its energy, it must also take other steps very urgently, including finding new supplies of gas and also switching to renewable energy. The ISAC project, Working Group Future of Gas, has recognized that urgent action is needed to keep lights on, keep industry working, and keep people warm in the short term could have very negative impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So, Anne, if I maybe can ask you the first question, unabated gas for the non-experts, that means gas is just burned and not the CO2 is not captured and stored in some way or used in some way. So, unabated gas, 
was long seen as a bridging technology from coal to sustainable energy. So what is the present perspective on this and what are the biggest challenges in phasing it out? Well, thank you very much for this um, insightful question. I think it, it addresses several issues. First of all, thank you for having me here today. So this is a great honor to sit among all those experts here on this panel. Thank you very much. I'm trying to answer your question um, in terms of why do we suddenly come to the conclusion as researchers that we should try to avoid burning or using fossil gas without carbon capture storage, well, it's pretty easy. It has been seen as a transitioning fuel to replace coal and oil power generation, right? F fired power generation. And that seemed to be very reasonable in the very short term. However, if we are honest, I think the idea is that the academic evidence, the scientific evidence, suggests that, and Wim pointed that out um, earlier on, the methane leakage is basically, or the methane emissions, a serious threat to climate change. And that has long not been addressed by the community. It has not been recognized. So therefore, as a consequence, it is essential that we try to avoid um, transporting natural gas across long distances because the methane leakage occurs along the supply chain, right? So most of the gas as of today is used where it is being produced. So <clears throat> we should try to keep it at that and not enter long-term supply arrangements with North American or Middle Eastern LNG providers. Um, <clears throat> So therefore, if you take the global warming po potential of natural gas into the equation, there is no other way around if you take net zero ambitions serious, right? At the same time, and I'm sure Nevin can argue a bit better than, than me on that, is the cost reduction that we observe in renewables. So we're switching the game somehow, right? So there is, natural gas is being overtaken by cost reductions in renewable power generation. There will be a need to uh, use natural gas in some industrial processes or some other areas, but I think the Norwegians, and I'm presenting the Norwegian perspective here a little bit as well, have to provide the evidence that carbon capture and sequestration is possible at large scale. Right? So there has been a lot of talk. I don't see any serious projects take, have, that have taken off. So I think the biggest obstacle at the moment is the investment in infrastructure that has been taking place, stranded assets, and, a, and an industry that has an inherent interest in keeping those um, trade flows going. So that would be my very first response to that. I'm sure we can have a discussion uh, later on, and I see Georg smiling already. Yeah, Georg, you want to come with other considerations. Yes, well, if you want to tackle energy transition, it's first of all, it's a global issue. It's a global task we have to tackle. And uh, really to get the solution, you have to look to the continents. And why to continents? Because you do not have uh, power lines between continents to exchange current on a large scale. We have a very few to England, for instance. And secondly, we do not have means to transport hydrogen from one continent to another. Uh, we have uh, ships for LNG or something like that, so liquid natural gas, and in the future, synthetic gas, but we do not have it for hydrogen. And therefore, all those hydrogen we need in Europe, we have to produce in Europe. This means enormous amounts of current to make out of current and water uh, hydrogen. You cannot easily build hydrogen ships. Uh, you have to cool down to minus 253 degrees C, Pipelines are also an issue because hydrogen makes it brittle, the steel, and therefore it will be a very long time frame uh, till you have that. And energy transition also means you should use what you have because then you need to invest additional efforts, materials, to build up parallel uh, energy paths. I think that's very important at the beginning that we rely on those 
vectors we already have, on the power stations we have, and in the midterm future, uh, these uh, substances that are used there will be synthetic. And from nature we can learn hydrogen is perfect energy carrier, but it has to be bonded to carbon or to nitrogen. If this would have been a benefit in, in the evolution, maybe we will all would have a bladder with some hydrogen inside. So hydrogen should always be bonded to carbon and nitrogen to have a high energy density. And that's what we can learn from nature. So this means for a solution, coal has to be stopped due to the low uh, energy you get out, two to three times more CO2 compared to the same energy quantity. Uh, and uh, methane is an essential, in my point of view, is an essential energy carrier, but we have to take care of the methane slip, that not methane evaporates into the air because it is very high, we've already heard from Wim, uh, the high impact. And therefore, it doesn't make very much sense that we import, for instance, fracking gas from US or from Canada, uh, when we still have in Austria, in Europe, a few not big reservoirs, but we have some. And this would reduce uh, the, the, the emissions of, of methane significantly. It's only a bridge, a bridge for the next 10, 15 years till we have sufficient e-fuels. Because if we cannot import current, if we cannot import hydrogen, we must import e-fuels. And e-fuels means hydrogen bonded to whatever. It could be diesel, petrol, methane, uh, ammonia. And they are able to be transported and we have carriers for that. Want so to say something about the quick response is we are not that far apart. I think we, the underlying idea that the the end of unabated gas is coming is clear to both of us. I think we, we are any, we agree on that. Um, I think we need to, and, and th this report is a future of gas and it's not the future of hydrogen report. And I think it's a completely different topic, I think, um, which we would need to discuss in a, in, a, in a different setting, I would say. I think there's a potential for hydrogen. I think hydrogen is overhyped at the moment. It's the same like CCS, you don't, you, you, you well, I would like to see the projects coming forward and being, being um, financially viable. Yeah, we have naturally switched to hydrogen, which was my third <laughs> question, but it doesn't matter. We can maybe continue there. Maybe, Nevin, you want to say something about this too? Uh, about hydrogen? Uh, uh, maybe to this topic about you know, gas transition first, and then also since we already have touched on hydrogen, <laughs> maybe you can say it. I, I think we touched hydrogen uh, already in a yes. way, and mm -hmm. uh, this is a very significant uh, issue uh, now that hype has started. It's not the first time hype was started. The first hype was in 2000, and then it died out. And I think this hype will um, also peter out uh, relatively soon. Uh, uh, let me steal uh, a comparison from Michael Librett. We can use hydrogen uh, for anything, like we can use Swiss knife for anything. Uh, but we are only going to use Swiss knife when we need to open a beer bottle. Uh, so hydrogen we are going to use uh, in very few uh, cases. Uh, we are definitely going to stay with huge excess of electricity in our power system because we will be mostly powered by cheap solar and wind, uh, which means that probably two-thirds of electricity will be excess if we want to satisfy all the electrical needs. Uh, we can electrify transport, electrify heating, but we are still going to be producing a significant amount of hydrogen. So where this hydrogen is going to go, uh, it is not going to go into heating because that is not really uh, reasonable. Uh, if you compare electric heating with heat pump um, and uh, uh, hydrogen in uh, uh, gas boilers, it's around uh, factor six to seven. So you, we need to build, we would need to build six to seven times more wind and solar uh, power plants. And we don't want to really cover all Europe in solar uh, uh, power plants and in wind power plants. Uh, in order to have uh, hydrogen in our gas boilers. So heating on hydrogen does not make any uh, sense thermodynamically, economically, uh, or environmentally. Uh, what about using hydrogen in transport? Uh, 
Uh, it doesn't really work. We have it, it's there, it's on the market, but we are selling, uh, uh, there are sales of maybe 1,000 cars per year, while there is uh, uh, huge markets now in tens of millions of electric cars. 50% of buses, city buses are now electric, uh, around 40% of two and three wheelers are electric, uh, and 13% uh, of cars uh, uh, are electric and hydrogen is not going anywhere. Uh, so why are we going to use, where are we going to use hydrogen? Uh, most of industries can actually be electrified, uh, but if we want to use the current equipment, we might need some fuel to burn. So this may be a transitional uh, uh, use of hydrogen for some industries which need high temperature processes. Uh, but we will need lots of feedstocks, chemical feedstocks, and that's where the hydrogen goes. We are currently using, a final energy use uh, is 2% hydrogen in Europe. It doesn't show in statistics, but it's huge. Two-thirds of that goes to production of um, uh, fertilizers, and one-third is used in refineries. Uh, we are going to convert all chemical industry uh, uh, to hydrogen-based uh, chemicals. So most of hydrogen is going to go that way. And then we come to another question. You know, Ruhrgebiet was built around a place where there was cheap coal. Do we really want to bring all this energy to Europe uh, in order to continue with uh, uh, energy uh, 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 intensive industries in Europe? Or should we go the Ruhrgebiet way and bring uh, the industry where the energy is cheap. Uh, er energy will be very cheap in uh, Scandinavia, for example. This is a great place to uh, place European industry. If we have industry which is not uh, strategic, uh, we can move it to Patagonia or Australia. If they are strategic, we should keep it closer, but we should move it uh, where uh, energy will be cheap. And part of that will be hydrogen, but Part of that will be um, other type of fuels, but I disagree with Georg uh, that we will use synthetic fuels for general use because this is again the problem of Swiss knife. We're only going to use it where we cannot use electricity. Uh, we are only going to use it where we cannot use hydrogen produced on the spot. So mostly in uh, long distance shipping, and long-distance airplanes. Well, hydrogen is essential to get out the oxygen from raw materials, steel, uh, calcium carbonate, uh, so all the metals. Currently, carbon is used. We, we emit CO2. And in the other case, we will produce water. And we need enormous quantities for that in Europe. Elsewise, we say we're no more interested in raw materials, we buy it from somewhere else. But this means deindustrialization of Europe. So all those companies that do that said, no, we cannot do that anymore. And to produce this, you need enormous amounts of, of current to, via electrolyzers, produce hydrogen. So that's, let's say, a, a, a chemistry. It's not for heating, 100% with you. Uh, but therefore, methane, and in the future, synthetic methane, is very important because energy density is three times more than hydrogen. We have all the means, we have the power plants, the backup power plants, because wind and solar is volatile. So when there's no wind, those cold and dark doldrums, then you need something. And it doesn't make sense if we convert it here in Europe twice. So we have to import that. So we have to import e-fuels, and it could be methanol, it could be methane or whatever, but green, of course. This means a closed CO2 circle a closed carbon circle. So we need pipelines for CO2 within Europe to transport the CO2. That it's a, ver a very uh, important substance, raw material, the CO2, to bring it to those that need it, to make out of the hydrogen the substance we really need. Yeah, if, if I may um, answer to that, I, I, I worked on um, a, re a okay. report on carbon capture and utilization and uh, uh, we came to conclusion that whatever can be electrified will be electrified. Uh, and yes, you uh, may need some carbon in uh, steel production, but this is a mi minor issue. 
It's not a significant issue. Yes, we will need lots of carbon for producing chemicals, and this carbon will be coming from biomass, and later on maybe we will be capturing from atmosphere. Uh, but we should be very uh, careful not to overuse that, because that means lower efficiencies. Uh, if you drive a car on uh, synthetic fuel, you need seven times more uh, uh, primary solar and wind than if you drive it on electricity. Okay. We'll have some... Also Thank you. Some, uh, I just wanted to come back, if I may, because I see we have young and old active scientists in the room, and you posed some questions which hopefully can be contributed to by some of our colleagues in the room. First of all, I think it's important to remember that not all the European countries are the same and there are big differences, especially in terms of resources. And I heard you mentioning a little bit earlier the question of fracking, of local availability of gas. And in the last few years, we have seen scientists moving ahead quite a long way with satellite monitoring of the emissions, particularly of methane emissions. And one of the reasons that our report was so strong on the topic of methane leakage was because we had the evidence. We have the satellite measurements over the areas, and you mentioned particularly, Anna, the, the United States, where the market has been triggered by the Russian invasion. We are now in the situation where entrepreneurs in the United States see an amazing market in Europe for LNG, and they are fracking like hell. And the result is that the regulation and the enforcement of the regulation of the methane leakage is not being applied sufficiently strictly. So if you open up a market with a regulatory framework that triggers this kind of thing, you have to have the regulatory <coughs> strength to enforce, to stop this leakage. Now, the Norwegians have shown that it is possible to deliver natural gas, methane, with very, very low levels of leakage. Technically, scientifically, it's possible. And they do it, and the evidence is there. You don't measure the leakage over Norway. So if you're thinking in Austria of trying to go for fracking, you will have to look at the economics, you will have to look at lots of social dimensions, but you also need to look at the regulatory framework and the risk that you pose, because fracking in particular means lots and lots of little holes. They don't last very long, they have a short lifetime, and they have to be properly capped at the end so that the leakage is properly stopped. And this is the sort of problem that we're seeing from the states. So I think the scientists have a role not only to give these messages, but also to come with the solutions. And I'm quite encouraged that my ex-colleagues in Brussels are now actively working on regulating the imported natural gas to Europe. Because we need to be sure that it comes with a certificate that shows, proves, properly monitored, that this gas coming in has not come in having had high leakage levels. These things are really important to the management of our transition. Yes, you're right, we will need to use some methane, but let's use the good methane, let's get the regulations and the monitoring and the certification in place so that these things work to protect us from this terrible result of global warming. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Bill. Um, when we, we all agree that we, in the long run or in the short run, as soon as possible, should get away from gas as one of the fossil fuel carriers, right? There is always the question, how do we do it and how do we make it as sustainable as fair as possible and have new, new side effects and risks for society? Hans has mentioned in his uh, introductory remarks, you know, the gas boilers that were supposed to be phased out in Germany and you now there was a big back and forth and now it seems like the right-wing part in Germany is getting ground. Now the Austrian government has decided to put an ice the law that we should phase out gas boilers very soon, or forbid gas boilers very soon. Um, but then, so a real question is how can we make uh, 
the how can we do that without negative society effects in this society and risks for society? And then the, I want to ask you, Hannah, this question as an expert. So how can we do this in, in renewable energy forms of energy and switch to them as sustainable and as good for society as possible? And then also, what contributions can science make to this for a specific ESAC? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I will start uh, from the perspective of, of uh, the business world, uh, the companies. Uh, you mentioned now, for instance, the Austrian case of, of, of gas boilers. Uh, without being having too much detailed knowledge about the, 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 the business working on that area <clears throat> in Austria, I'm sure that there are companies who, who have been working hard on, on finding alternatives. Uh, they have been uh, supported by the, by the legal mechanisms to start looking for, for alternatives. And now, th this, is, this is poison for, <laughs> for companies going back and forth with our legislation. This is just an example. And, and as I said, I'm not really an expert on the Austrian case, but I could give you examples from Finland of similar situations with some other products or services. Uh, and this is really poison for the, for the companies. Those who are putting resources into, into, into research innovations and, and, and uh, they are trusting on certain legal uh, framework. Uh, what we've seen in our, in, in our research, uh, the, the, let's say the long-term uh, predictable, stable legal uh, fr framework or legal environment for, for, for a business world, uh, anyhow producing these innovations. Uh, together with, with research, researchers, uh, for them that is one of the main issues that they can trust on the on the uh, the change that is taking place. Uh, also, uh, from from uh, from another perspective, if I had just another perspective, as I said, there would be many perspectives to look look this issue into. If we look at the households, so private consumers, private people. Uh, some of them uh, are really, uh, we, we, uh, someone mentioned in, in, in the, the first, uh, this, uh, first uh, presentations the energy poverty issue. Maybe all of you actually, I'm not sure. Uh, that is a serious issue for some of the households. Not all, but some of the households. And therefore, uh, that's something that we have to look at seriously. And we have to find ways somehow to compensate for those who are then, then really suffering from. From, from these changes, uh, if, if there are increases in prices. At the same time, and now I'm taking a Finnish example, uh, last year, 22, uh, the Finnish uh, government decided to uh, temporarily, temporarily uh, come sort of um, draw, make, draw back its decision to increase uh, the, the uh, requirement for uh, traffic fuel suppliers to add renewable components into, into the, the fuel mix. There was a road plan for 2030 and uh, it, it should be 34% if I remember correctly now, uh, the, the part of renewable uh, component in, in the traffic fuels in Finland and that is then uh, aiming for, for uh, European um, objectives. So, because of the, the uh, Russian attack and, and everything that it caused in the energy market with the prices, the Finnish government last year decided to hold back with the increase uh, in the, in the re renewables uh, to make sure that the, the traffic fuel prices would, would not be increasing at the same time that everything else, electricity prices, heating prices were going up very, very strongly. Uh, this year, that was just supposed to be for one year, now this year the whole thing uh, was, was cancelled at the moment uh, or, or stopped. There is still a demand but, it, but there is no sort of way forward to, to the 34 at the moment. It's, it's an open issue uh, in, in a way uh, how, how, we, how we go forward with that. Now again, those companies working in the, in the traffic fuel industry again had invested a lot in, in increasing the renewable component in their in the traffic fuels. Uh, they have been voicing very loudly this very same issue of, of, of not 
not being able to, to, to use the investments they have already made. So they are, we are anyhow losing if we look at the issue at the, at the, uh, at the um, whole economist level. So someone is losing anyhow in, 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 in this situation. Let me start by this. Uh, it's interesting, right? So Someone you say, I, I completely can follow your argument that you really need to stick to your plans if you lay them out, unless otherwise the innovation industry will stop innovating and they will stop doing things and investing and you will have a real problem because then the energy transition is not going forward because people mm. get confused and fall off and get yeah. frustrated. I can, I can see that. But the question is then what do you do with the people who have to deal with high energy prices and what to do the people who are suddenly confronted with the fact that they have cha to change the heating in the apartment or a house to a heat pump or something like that. So what do you do with this, this aspect of society? And people, that was the problem in Germany, right? And that's yep. why also, you know, it's high prices. So people complain about high prices, governments do something or it's about changing. What do you do about this aspect? Yep. And it's the same in many other countries, if, if not all European countries at the moment, probably. Uh, there are ways then to support, of course, needs the means from, 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 from the government or from the country to do it. But there are different ways of, of supporting either through uh, energy efficiency improvements, uh, either through some, some tax uh, systems of uh, changes in there. So they, there are ways to, to support. Mm -hmm. I think what is important, uh, I uh, hinted into that somewhere earlier, said that then we of course have to look at who need the help from the households. Mm -hmm. We don't need to waste the money for everyone, not all of us. So give yeah. efficient help. So, so to keep it, keep it fair and keep it uh, sustainable, <laughs> let's put it right. this way. Also economically sustainable. Yeah. Bill seems to have some so I, I was just going to build a little bit, I hope, on what you were saying, because we must not forget the reason why we are doing this. If the cost is going up a little bit, what happens if we don't? do it. And what we're seeing is already floods, fires, all kinds of health-related problems, diseases changing. There are many things which are happening because of the fact that we're using these fuels. And so the reason to move to renewables is not nothing. I mean, there's a good reason for it. And the financial picture over a reasonable time frame, let's say 10, 15 years, it's very evident that it's a cheaper solution. The challenge is to manage the financing in the short term so that the impact on you and me as individuals, as householders, as mothers, fathers, whatever we are, we have to manage a much shorter term economy. So, what I find very encouraging is that in the banking institutions, in the financing institutions, we have more and more green financing systems coming into place. We have commitments, particularly from the European Investment Bank, to bring money available to help make this happen. We have the commitment as part of the Green Deal to getting money to make it fair, to make available pay money to, 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 to reduce the energy poverty. But we need the confidence at the local and national political levels. And this is where I'm hoping Professor Riahi will have something to say, because we need to be able to demonstrate by thorough modeling analyses that what we're showing is going to work. And that implies bringing in more, st I mean, there's plenty of work for scientists. We've got storage to improve, a lot of work to understand how to use heat and electricity storage better. We need to be able to make our integrated energy system as low cost as possible through this transition period. And this is where I bow my head and say, I hope the modelers can help us to get this message over because only with that computer modeling can we concretely show that this is going to work in the best possible way. So I, I step back and wait for Professor Rihahi to convince me that he's got the answers beautifully laid out uh, so that it will convince our politicians and uh, senior scientists. 
Please, <laughs> Kevin, please tell us how to do it. What we That's the question, yeah. So, um, I mean, first of all, I was really excited when you, when you explained that we need to change communication um, and that we uh, need to communicate that this is actually not a transition to a system which will cost more, but it's a transition where we have an upfront investment with long-term benefits. And um, this is something that, uh, that recent studies have shown very evidently. In, in 2021, uh, we gathered all the main international modeling teams um, to explore exactly that question. Basically, to think about, is it, should we invest now and should we invest into uh, the energy transition or should we, do we still have time to wait um, to, uh, to, and, and uh, basically are then also hit by more severe climate impacts. And, this, and, the, and the results were across very different methodologies, across very different teams from Europe, from the US, uh, from Asia, uh, all the same. They all said, yes, it will cost a little bit in the near term, but there are long-term benefits, even if we don't, even if we don't take into account the impacts. Um, and this is because we are investing into a system which, which we now empirically understand learns much faster than the traditional old system which is so much supply side um, focused on, on big power plants, on nuclear and coal, where the, the learning and the experimentation simply doesn't function as quickly as investing into solar and wind where you repeat the same thing over and over and costs have dropped. Uh, enormously in the last 10 years. Who would have thought 10 years ago that, that, that solar would cost 10% of what it costed, at double the efficiency? Everybody would have uh, called you an, an, a dreamer. And it, this dream has become reality, and we are not communicating it well enough, I think. I think that's really a problem. But if you, if you ask me, okay, what, what do we need to, uh, what we need to do in the near term in order to manage this transition, I think we need to prepare ourselves to create this infrastructure for direct and indirect electrification. Uh, what do I call indirect ele ele electrification? All the other solutions that we discussed over hydrogen, over e-fuels, etc. all of that is actually using electricity, making something else out of it to be able to store it or to transport it in a better way. And the key question for Europe will be, can we build high voltage power lines? It seems that we cannot do this anymore. And if we cannot improve our grid, it will be very difficult to implement a new renewable system. We can get some way with distributed small systems which are disconnected, but we can get much further and much, quick, much quicker if we um, invest basically into electric infrastructure, also into hydrogen. It's not only a question of, it is a question of industry, of course, I completely agree with, with you, and, uh, but, but also with, 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 with your point. Um, it's, um, so that's one question, but, but we need also to move from a discussion of only looking at supply, supply side and trying to understand what is the service that people actually demand. Uh, what are those disruptive changes that we can introduce at the demand level so that we create a new service system which is better than the current one, but at the same time decarbonized. Mobility is a very nice example. So at the moment, everybody thinks we cannot switch away from, from cars. I need the car in order to get from A to B. This is because we don't have any alternatives. There is no business model for an integrated mobility service which connects public transport you know, with, with individual electric cars, which might be a niche market in the future, and all different other types of modes. Um, but this is more how we organize our service systems rather than this is not a, a given that we, we need to stay in the, in the car-based system. It's just because the car-based system is at the moment the one which works best. We have to invest into the alternatives in order to be able to switch. And that's also important for policymakers to learn. You need to invest first and then make people switch. Don't make people switch before the alternative is there, because then you get many people with yellow vests on the streets who will tell you, no, we will not pay more for the gasoline because I need my car to get from A to B. And I think there's a policy question, there's a social question, and then there's the technology question. And if you ask me, the policy 
and the social question is perhaps the tougher at the moment than the technological supply side. Yeah. Okay. Nevin, please. I, if I can go back to um, a, a normal person uh, buying a gas boiler. He is buying a technology that he is going to use for the next 20, 25 years. He is actually buying a stranded cost because we have to uh, turn it off by 2050 for sure. We are now in 25. So by not telling that uh, normal people that uh, gas is a stranded cost, we put future costs on them. That. That's not fair. So we have to start communicating about this issue. Uh, this is a very important point that I don't see getting through uh, to normal people. Uh, 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 oh, oh, Professor uh, Fassmann has uh, clearly uh, said that we can have a danger of extreme parties coming to power using this issue. But this is issue that is going to happen sooner or later. So we have to start communi communicating now that issue and also the solution to that problem uh, is existing. I think Vienna is doing quite good job in uh, planning transition. Um, I would be very happy if uh, Zagreb was doing it so, so well. Uh, uh, of course, every, uh, all the time you have two steps forward, one step back. It happens. Uh, but clearly, the right way to go is to uh, resolve one zone after another zone, uh, to offer people alternative solutions, and then uh, to have uh, proper subsidies for people to switch to sustainable solutions. Uh, these people were not guilty uh, because of climate change, because they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, the, uh, it's not their fault they bought uh, the gas boiler. Uh, they were told to buy gas boiler, so they should not be punished for that uh, decision. Uh, society has to socialize part of that cost, and this has to be communicated in the right way. Okay, we are now moving to uh, the new world, uh, but you're not going to be penalized for that because it was not your mistake. Uh, we have solutions for that. We will be able to implement it. Your uh, Bezirk will come in uh, order in, I don't know, seven years or 15 years, and then we will slowly be exchanging gas boilers with district heating or heat pumps. I just wanted to have a quick extension on that and I'm looking in that corner of the room because you look as if you're actually out there in the field and doing research, um, which I appreciate. Um, I think we also, I mean, everybody's doing research, don't take that, uh, but, I, but, but I think we, don't, we, we need to understand how those subsidies and support schemes work in different places of the world, right? So look at what governments have taken, which actions they have taken in 2022, given the high prices, and how they supported people who are on dole and who are on support from the system. And then try to evaluate, did they actually reduce their energy consumption or did they use their money for something else? And I think... On a, on a very, you know, down to household level expertise, we don't know how this is implemented and how this affects the citizen who will vote at the end of the day. Going back to the social question here. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Yes, Georg. I think it is, it's essential that we have huge amounts of storable fuels because we have to shift from the summer to the winter for instance, in Austria, about 60 terawatt hours of energy from the summer where we collect to the winter. This means current is not sufficient. We need storable energies. And methane can be a bridging technology till all this is green. It is synthesized. And in between, because currently the uh, government says, yes, you should use heat pumps. Nice idea, but uh, the supply is not possible. Uh, those 1.5 kilowatt each household has cannot additionally uh, power a heat pump. So you need for the next, again, 10, 15 years, and it takes as long as that, to pump up the power of the grid by a factor of two or three. To, on one hand, supply, instead of gas boilers, a heat pump. So there you need innovations, for instance, fuel cells to do that. And the fuel cells could be powered currently by gas, natural gas, but in perhaps five or 10 or 15 years, then it's green gas. 
So you get more, you again, save him time, you have more time uh, to bring up the grid to the level we need. And all those storable energies should be, in my point of view, imported because the energy density is very high and the trick is we only import the carrier and the energy comes out when you add oxygen from the environment and this means 10, 15 times more weight. So the energy density is very high of those energy carriers and uh, we cannot do that with current. If we do it with current, we are limited to 3 gigawatt or 3,000 megawatt uh, Regelreserve in German and in English, uh, the term is frequency containment reserve. And if that's more, this would be one power line, a big power line with four gigawatt. If this fails, we have a blackout in Europe. So we, we cannot, technical wise, import current on a large scale. This makes no sense. So we have to produce these currents here in Europe. Uh, yes, I would uh, uh, disagree with this. Um, uh, you should not look at the system working uh, in the same time, everything in the same time. Uh, 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 there is installed uh, uh, consumption in Europe which is many times higher than the uh, 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 supply side, than the capacity to cover that. But uh, it's never switched on all the time. Um, I really doubt that uh, typical Austrian home is only 1.5 uh, kilowatt, mm -hmm. um, uh, because then you would not be able to use a washing machine and a machine for washing dishes, and I think that uh, would be under the, uh, uh, the level of civilization level that uh, you have here in Vienna. Uh, so with uh, three and a half kilowatts, you can uh, perfectly well uh, uh, power a heat pump, uh, and the trick with uh, uh, peaks is following. Uh, we need heat storage. Heat storage is very cheap uh, in order to breach the very cold hours. We have only a relatively small number of minus 20 Celsius temperatures. Uh, when we need peak power, uh, we can handle that with uh, heat storage. That's why district heating is hugely better than individual heating systems, uh, because heat storage <coughs> on district heating level is very cheap. Uh, and by storing hot water, uh, we can actually do it uh, incredibly much cheaper than the way you uh, uh, suggest. Uh, Danish are doing that way. Every district heating in Denmark already has uh, heat storage. Even in Zagreb, we already have heat storage. Uh, heat storage is cheap, and it can balance those days when you have minus 20, and they're happening now once in a while, uh, but in 10 years' time, they will probably not happen uh, at all. Uh, so we can handle heating uh, fully on electricity, uh, uh, it's better to use large heat pumps, water, water heat pumps, using either uh, river water or even better sewage water, or if you have geothermal water, that's perfect. Uh, we have huge amounts of water bodies uh, around Europe and we can use electricity to heat that, store heat, and then heat our homes used uh, from heat storage. Uh, Danish uh, 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 quantity of uh, stored heat that is needed for 100% system based on wind uh, is around four cubic meters per dwelling. Uh, uh, Danish have uh, much more uh, degree days than we have uh, around here, uh, so we probably have uh, need a little bit less uh, than that. Uh, you can perfectly do it, well do it in a uh, house because in house you have space for maybe two cubic meters of hot water. In apartments, it's not a solution. That's why we should not push heat pumps in apartments because we cannot balance that. Uh, with that, we don't need any fuels, uh, any fuel storage apart from the fuel for long distance transfer, uh, transport. Okay. okay, so what we need to get there. So one thing was we need, you need power lines, right? You said we need mm -hmm. power lines in Europe. That's yeah. a real big stumbling stone. What other things do we need? that we would give advice to policymakers at this point? Uh, well, shall I? 
Sure. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, we need to build as much wind and solar as possible. I hope that the new uh, regulation from uh, uh, European Union uh, that is going to enable faster um, uh, permitting of wind will uh, have a positive effect. We'll see. Uh, we will need probably double grids than we have now to do that. Uh, and we need to enable uh, demand response technologies. This is crucial. So we need to link a wholesale price with retail price of electricity. So when I charge my electric car, uh, I can actually play on wholesale markets. Uh, this is already being done in Denmark because they are so much more advanced than the rest of us. Uh, uh, but it's very easy to implement it. You only need an up and a tariff and nothing else. You don't need some expensive smart grid for that. You need an app and you need a tariff which is uh, uh, 15 minutes based. Uh, uh, with this, we can uh, actually electrify heating with variable renewables, electrify transport with variable renewables uh, in a very, very cheap way. And then, of course, we need electrolyzers which has to go down by price maybe three times from uh, current 1,000 uh, 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 euros per kilowatt to maybe 300 uh, 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 to make it uh, viable and then use hydrogen uh, for production of feedstocks. But my main concern is actually not on the technical side. We solved everything technically. We have solutions already for at least 10, 15 years. Uh, we also have economic solutions for everything. Uh, the problem is how to communicate it. So I would say that the major barrier to further transition is social or socio-political. And we need to include uh, uh, social sciences into this process uh, because without improving our communication skills, uh, it will go very slowly. We can do very fast transition uh, and it will be cheaper than staying with the current solutions or with going with uh, not yet invented solutions. Uh, but the problem is communication. This is what I say. How to involve uh, social sciences in the right way. Because they have to communicate with people and they have to uh, uh, create communication with the public uh, which will resonate with uh, the problems of a small person. Anne, do you feel like you are the right person to well, I've, comment I, on that? Well, I feel I'm glad that I can work at NTNU in Trondheim in Norway because we, we do that in everything that we do. We include all social sciences. We have understood that in any research, energy or environmental research, this is part next to the engineers. It's difficult to un to, to sort of convince you engineers about that, um, but I'm glad to hear from you that you're prepared to take that action. <laughs> Um, the second point is, I think, um, every single person on this panel and in this room also needs to walk the talk, right? I don't need an app for my car because I don't have a car. I never had one, right? Um, so I think it's also a generational thing. I think it's also adjustment of behaviors. Mm, I have a severe problem with us standing or sitting on a stage and talking about people who are not in this room and I find that very, very difficult um, and I have not made up my mind how to communicate sort of with <coughs> citizens I think is the right description. Um, I think we, we, we need to, every single person on this panel needs to talk to citizens and we are all citizens and I think one thing that is has not been mentioned by Nevin is a demand response. I think we need to think about our behavior. I think um, on an indi very individual level, we need to adjust our behavior. And uh, that would be, those would be my points that are required for the transition. But maybe I'm just the young naive on this stage here. <laughs> Hannah, yes? Yes, if I may ask, uh, <coughs> add something on, on what needs to be done. Uh, it seems to be clear uh, that in, in a big transition, like energy transition, we will have winners, but we also have losers. And now if I'm again looking back to, to, to the business world, 
to the industries, uh, there will be those who will lose the, the profession, who will lose their, their, their companies, uh, their services, whatever they have been doing in the fossil uh, sort of economy, um, who are tied up to the fossil economy. So we need to also look at them, uh, because they will then be not just uh, victims of energy poverty, but poverty overall. So we need, need to look at those people, uh, start retraining them, finding them, them other options. Uh, there will be a lot of work in the, in the sort of the winner side <laughs> of, of the story. So that's one option, but of course there are other options then too. Mm -hmm. uh, if we are not looking at the, those, uh, those uh, sectors, those industries, and those people who are the losers in this game, that will cause, of course, friction in the, in the society as a whole. So I think that's a very important part of the story. Okay, thank you. Um, any comments on this aspect, Bill? So we're kind of pulling together what we think might be the most important things yes, we should be focusing so. on. So from my perspective, there are three big areas of energy demand. Buildings, industry and transport. And they're different in each country. So it's right that some things are done at a European level, and ESAC targets what's happening primarily at a European level. But we're now looking to see if we couldn't do more at a national level to support the actual country governments themselves. That means, from my perspective, that we need to think about education because there's a whole new area here which is emerging in some parts of Europe but not all to educate people better from school right through. Particular, I think it's not such a big problem I understand here in Austria but in many parts of Europe craftsmen have been eliminated. They're extinct. They don't exist. It's really difficult to find them. We need to regenerate and strengthen our training for craftsmen who can put in these famous heat pumps and PV cells and all the other things. So I see an education and communication issue. I see a different mix of skills needed. The other thing that we've talked about, I think, is the need to move to a new understanding of the way financing is working. And that has another fundamental implication that we have not discussed this afternoon, excuse me, but that's emission trading. If you look at the emission trading system, it's targeted on reducing carbon emissions. What happens when we get to zero? Has anybody really got a plan to phase in a new scheme to be sure that we're incentivizing the right direction for our investments as we move to a position where imposing extra costs doesn't actually work as well anymore. I think there's a, a whole fundamental social science dimension to this, which is enormous, from financing to supports and subsidies. We need a subsidy scheme, but we shouldn't be subsidizing fossil fuels anymore. We need to look at a new and better way of subsidizing the right investment schemes. And I come back, Professor Rihari, to you. If we don't have a solid base and confidence in the sums being done, in the calculations being done, then we can't get the confidence of the decision makers to make these very crucial decisions in good time. And the decisions have to be made soon because climate warming is very quick. Can you I want to comment on that, Evan? Seems to be a triangle. You always put me on the spot. And then I <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> come but I, I actually, I wanted also to come yeah, in. Okay. Perhaps, I'm not, I'm not opening new themes, but let me, uh, let me perhaps mention two things that I did not hear, but which I think is really important. Um, uh, I consider it very likely that we will not be able to decarbonize every activity um, in Europe, and uh, this is also what, by the way, all the modeling studies show, that there will be residual emissions in some sectors, and if it's only the agricultural sector, yeah, which is very difficult to decarbonize. So we need to find out also how to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, and we need to be prepared for that. The lead-in times to finding out how this works in terms of technological innovation. If you don't want to do it, of course, with um, 
Uh, and trees are the most effective way of doing it, uh, afforestation. But we know also how vulnerable our forests are, particularly in Europe, and particularly in Austria. We have learned this the hard way, I would say, the last 10 years. Um, um, so what are, what are those perhaps nature-based solutions and technological solutions to take CO2 out of the atmosphere? I think that's uh, really important. And to understand also the trade-offs of those solutions and where that creates, sometimes they create actually synergies as well. I've, my ERC is actually exactly in this, in this area, so we're doing lots of research on the, at the ASA um, about, about uh, carbon dioxide removal. And then um, something that has not been mentioned so much is the importance of our institutions and governance. Yeah? So see, European Union has found out how to build institutions. I think they're world champion in institutions and governance. Yeah. I'm part of the European Advisory Board on Climate Change and I'm continuously impressed how this uh, triangle between science, uh, decision makers, the operational level, which I consider the commission itself, how this triangle works because the institutions exist yeah? and how it cannot work in countries. Maybe we still don't have a climate law in Austria. Uh, this, is, this is actually really something that we need to work on jointly scientists and, and, and the policymakers to build the institutions so that we can also tackle this integrated, this, this, this integrated, climate change is a problem which goes into all different areas of our society and only if you have the institutions that bring climate thinking into all the policies that we, that we do, we, we will be able actually to transform, uh, to transform the system at the, at, at the end and create incentives for the individuals uh, so that they, they benefit from, from the transitions and we minimize the losers. Thank you. Okay. Good. Um, before I, I open this question and answer session, so we will invite questions and answers from the, from the audience. Is there any issue that any of you still want to bring up and discuss that I think we should really touch upon? No? Okay, then I would very much welcome, and in order to see better, I will move over there. Um, any questions from the audience to our great panelists, please? Yeah, okay. Yeah, one. <coughs> Sorry. When I when I see the um, the title of the of this panel here, realistic ambitions, I've seen just last week disappointing low ambitions expressed by the German finance minister. We will not be able to stop coal burning by 2030, so let's uh, rather stop the ambition to do it. Where are the ambitious perspectives now from the European Commission to liaise with an African state to create energy plans there to, what, by whatever means, um, transport energy to once to Europe, but also use part of that to electrify the country. I've seen villages without any uh, electricity support there. Couldn't that stabilize all the politically situation in some countries by advancing their life standard? And the third command on it, wouldn't that be a good initiative for IASAC to, to create like a Club of Rome report, how to develop ambitious ideas to, on a global scale to improve situations and just to get on a more populistic manner people involved and say, oh, yes, that sounds like a great idea. I would support it. Okay. Bill, do you want to answer? If, if I have correctly understood your question, you're suggesting that ESAC should be working with some of the developing countries to help them with their energy problems? No. No, I misunderstood? The other way around. Maybe some people in the room know more than I do, but there are partnerships between Europe and Africa which are paid for by the Commission. There's a, a lot of cooperation structure within the European Union for such collaborations. And ESAC itself actually 
five years ago, six years ago, something like this. We did a project on the electrification of small villages. If you have a look on our website, you'll see the uh, villages project with the result of that, which had quite a lot of uh, documentation and reports produced. So it was a, a targeted initiative in this direction as well. Georg, you want to yeah. comment? Of course, it would be a great chance if we go to growing nations where you could harvest lots of green energy and uh, take this green energy, convert it, transport it to a transportable means of energy. Because the energy density of, of wind and solar is poor. It's really poor. So you should, con uh, this means 10,000 of square kilometers do you need so that you get a significant quantity of a transportable fuel. And the trick with this fuel is always that you do not transport the oxygen here, but the oxygen is already there. So you only transport the hydrogen bonded to carbon or nitrogen. And this would, be, this would support the sustainable development goals one and two. So give them labor, so against poverty, and second, hunger, fight hunger. So they, you get enormous, you need many, many workers, local workers to do that. Uh, before the next question comes, please. Yeah, perhaps also adding to, to this question, um, um, I think it's what, what you're referring to is very much a strategic question. So basically it's a question also of energy uh, security. We know that if you would like to uh, basically replace the whole energy of Austria with solar PV, uh, it's between 1% to 3% of our, of our land that we need. We are not resource constrained. Uh, and we are definitely not resource constrained if you think about the efficiency improvements that are happening at the moment with solar PV cells. Um, we can actually our urban area is larger than the area that we would need for, for solar to provide uh, the whole energy of Austria. So, so it's not that we have to go to Africa and, and produce energy there and import it. Um, it's about uh, what sort of dependency and vulnerability do you want to create? And, and put yourself into an African, uh, if, into the shoes of an African. Uh, so we, 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 we want to have the, the energy from Africa imported to Europe, while at the same time all developing countries point at us and say, you have to show us that this transition works before we are going to invest into it. So we, we have to do lots at home also because of international psychological mo momentum that is necessary. And the scientific studies show you, so, so we, we, we made a study in nature not, not that long ago, three years, four years ago, where we assessed the potential for energy trade in electricity to ultra high voltage, uh, low loss distribution lines. And we found actually that those, those, those transmissions, it's about 10% of the system. It's not that you would start to import major ways um, uh, from, from, from those countries. The benefit for Europe would be that you have the value chain of energy production within the country and don't throw m money basically at, at others to provide us that energy. So. Okay, thank you. Marina, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much for this very insightful discussion. Um, I, I am a social scientist. Yeah? Okay. Um, actually, I'm an environmental historian, and we can discuss if history is a social science or not, but I would think in the, in the greater realm, I have to do with this dirty, ugly reality, and not with the shiny technology that actually has solved all the problems. Um, and the dirty reality is that we are facing a climate justice challenge that some of you have alluded to in the, the yellow vests, yeah, the gilets jaunes. Um, but then you're calling for two things, communication and education, and that makes me wince. Um, because education is a very, very long-term project. Um, and there is this tendency for everybody to be the most happy to educate primary school kids because they're easiest. And then as soon as you get to teenagers who have their own ideas about the world, people get more reluctant. Um, then there is this kind of, okay, when they come to university, at least they know what they want. Um, we can give them super fine master's degrees in what not, climate some things. And we're actually doing that already. So education, I think, is not the, 
the cool thing that's going to change everything. And communication, uh, yes, it's all about communication, but it's not about communication as such. It's about two things that never get mentioned. One is interests, very powerful interest groups that shape communication by something that is called advertisements. Um, corporate communication is communication for a reason. That reason is called profit. And that is not just communication. And the other thing is communication is, and that's a very old truism, is shaped by the channel through which it comes. And social media have totally disrupted our ability to speak as a society. We are now actually emotionally tied to what is called echo rooms, but should rather be called echo prisons. And I don't see that any discussion on energy transition and stuff like that that I've been following over the last five years or so has made any significant progress in this dirty, ugly business of real people with real media and real problems. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you, Reina. Please, Nevin. Uh, I'm afraid you said it all. You said it so beautifully. Uh, and I don't have a good answer uh, to this, but uh, uh, one way how to uh, cheat that problem is to use uh, 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 human properties. Uh, for example, uh, people like to uh, be more powerful than others. Uh, it's an ugly part of our human nature. Uh, but this is what Elon Musk used to kill uh, internal combustion engine. He came out with a product that was uh, something that people wanted to have because it's fast, uh, it is uh, a coveted product. Uh, and that's how uh, electric car actually won in the market. It was a very difficult battle. Electric cars were tried uh, several times in the last century, uh, but it always failed because it was the underdog. We went through uh, the lower ranks of the market, but if you attack the market from the above, uh, 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 pr uh, making a green product which is actually powerful, uh, then you play with the dark side of the nature in the right way. Uh, I think this is a, a good example, but I would like to see more of such examples. How to do the same thing with the gas boilers. How to make heat pumps uh, fashionable. Uh, because if we cannot uh, play on the good nature of people, we have to play on their dark side. Uh, uh, social networks have uh, uh, proven to be a difficult animal, I agree. Uh, but they're also an interesting pathway how we can communicate. Uh, it is uh, uh, something that we are not working enough on. We should think how to uh, handle these new channels of communication that are now more powerful than uh, traditional channels of communication. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Michael? First, Michael, and then there was a question here. Mm -hmm. um, the International Energy Agency recently predicted that the, the global peak of fossil fuel use in the energy system will be in the next four years or so. That also means CO2 emissions or emissions from the energy system will peak in a few years. So maybe we are already in a, in a dynamic, in a global dynamic towards renewables which nobody can, can stop anymore. What do you think about this? Yes, yes, have on. Yeah, but, but, but what you're describing is what others called uh, social tipping points in the system. So 
you, you, you put an upfront investment into a new option. You, actually, you, companies do that all the time. Yeah? So they, they invest into something which starts in a laboratory, which is very expensive, then they buy down costs, put it on the market for subsidies, and then if it's taken up and if it's commercialized, you let the technology go. Mobile phones is a very good example, what really happened very quickly in the past. And this is what you see with renewable energy in many, many of the markets. And what renewable energy has in addition um, is that actually in poor countries, it helps you uh, to solve energy access issues there where you don't have the investment for big grids. So in Bangladesh, you have millions of roofs which, uh, with small PV panels and a battery. That's, that's a transitional, that's what, that's what I call the new transitional technology. It's there so that children can have actually access to education in the nights, yeah? so that there's some light in the nights, and they have minimum electricity for, for your home. Um, yeah, if you try to ch achieve the same with the grid, you need to spend billions, and that's how this technology diffuses into the market, also without support in, in many areas. I have a Yes, please. Maybe, maybe my first instinct to that report was, okay, but you're providing or you're opening a door to a very dark room because it, you could also look at the consequences and think, well, okay, let's go for beer. We have done everything. And I think that is really a danger. So I'm very skeptical about that. So I'm, I'm thinking about the implication about reaching that tipping point, right? If it is correct, then we are lucky. But if we, if we have misjudge that, then we have an even more serious problem. What is your thinking this, there? I mean, this doesn't mean that we don't have to invest into the supporting infrastructure. Okay, yeah? thank we you. We also invest into the supporting infrastructure of fossil fuels right now. Yeah? You cannot drive with a car without maintaining streets. Mm -hmm. right? that, that's, an, that's, a, that's an investment that, that the, uh, the, 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 the country and the state does so that technologies which operate can function. So the infrastructure needs to be needs to be built, and that's of course the same as for the for the for the for the renewable technologies. But in many cases, they are now cheaper than the fossil technologies, particularly after the war, which shows us how vulnerable we are to price disruptions. So it's also strategically um, worth the investment. But I think it needs to be stated in the same sentence. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. Sorry, I did not. Oh God. No, no, you didn't. Sorry. <laughs> Good point. So first here, and then there were two questions in the back with the white shirt. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's, okay. That's okay. Stefan, you go ahead and then, then the person in the front. Please. Yeah, in my, my perception, very often the energy transition, at least in the general public, is like uh, perceived as just keep going what you do with your consumption, but we're just switching from fossil to renewables. But it's not really transported to the people that you really need to reduce uh, the energy flux. So you have to save energy because uh, you cannot produce energy in renewables in, in a, such a high level as you do it by simply extracting fossils. So how do you see that we can really reduce in absolute terms and, and per, per capita at least, the, the energy consumption. And I think this is also very much a, a, a social question because this is what you see, I mean, uh, as a, often as a rebound effect. No? The, the car industry says, yeah, our engine is more efficient, let's say 5%, and then you can easily buy a, a car which uh, weighs 20% more and so you have saved nothing. No? So how can we sell? that uh, overall the energy flux needs to reduce. Yes, please, first Nevan and then Kevin. Uh, by electrification of transport, we reduce uh, consumption by factor four. By electrification of heating, we reduce by factor three. Uh, so these are important technologies for reduction of uh, use of energy. But I'm very skeptical about uh, saving energy. Uh, we are talking about saving energy to schools, uh, to, to our children in schools, and what is the result? Zero. There is no uh, effect. You probably have uh, less than 5% of people which will save energy if you tell them to save energy. The rest of people will just behave according to their pockets. Uh, so we should not really count very much on individual actions. We should uh, uh, 
introduce technologies that save energy. Uh, buildings, we can easily reduce uh, for three times the energy that is lost through envelopes. Uh, uh, so this is another important technology, but it takes time. Uh, and that's approximately it. But uh, uh, otherwise, uh, we should just switch to sustainable energy in order to remove uh, the carbon emissions, because this is our major problem. Uh, if you want to keep um, uh, uh, the amount of energy which is uh, used uh, without rebound effect, the best solution is to triple the price of energy. If you think this is socially acceptable, that's the way to go. If not, then you have to live with some kind of rebound effect, yes. Kevin? Yeah, so, so one, one way to do it, you just heard from Nevin, there's enormous efficiency improvement potential there, which can bring you also down in absolute levels. But I think the, the other part is to, to very carefully think about services that people want. Yeah? So I, I, I don't think that you can actually tell people you don't want to have that, yeah? so, that so, so that I think that, that won't work. But if you, if you change uh, trains in a way that they become cooler than a Tesla, then people will take that train. Perhaps they will have a train office or go on showers in the, in the trains. They, they will be as cool as airports. Then people will, will travel with the train. They will consume the same service, but they will use much less uh, energy because also they change their behavior. So behavioral change actually doesn't work in my mind to communication. Behavioral change works through uh, providing this, the structure so that people actually demand something else. They see the benefit of that switch, and then you can bring energy down. And if you look at the energy consumption in Europe and the energy consumption in the US, we are already since a while on a downward, a downward slope. Con constant, or many, many European countries, actually the energy use has been going down, but the service that we consume has, going, has gone up. So that's, that's my, my, my own interpretation of it. I know that I might be a minority opinion here, and many people think, I will change our behaviors, we, but, I, but I don't think this, will, this is going to be a majority, um, a majority program, if you wish so. Okay, Bill. So I was just going to say, I think, um, I think you're right that it's difficult, the energy efficiency agenda. From a European perspective, Brussels has always set not only targets for getting more renewables into the market, but also targets for energy efficiency year by year to get better. What we've seen is that the appliances are doing better. If you buy a washing machine today, it consumes less energy than the one that you bought five years ago. The, the appliances are, are, are certainly showing improvement. We've already heard the transport is changing quite a lot. In our report, the ESAC report on the decarbonization of buildings, we also highlighted the fact that there's a good correlation between a low greenhouse gas emission building and a healthy building, a building which is good for you, uh, pleasant to be in, and good for your health. It typically has more daylighting, it has better quality, in, indoor air quality is better. There are several things, that you're not drafty, your, your thermal comfort is good. From a health point of view, a, a low greenhouse gas emission building is better. And we have to look at, sorry, the communications might not work as well as you want them to, but I think if we can get some of these very genuinely, honestly good messages out that actually, if you improve the quality of your building, you will not only improve your health, but you actually reduce the cost of running it because you'll have less energy for it. These things have to be presented in ways that I'm not very good at doing, but th there are clever people who can give these messages, and we have to find the best way of doing it. But we do have good messages, we do have the evidence which drives in a positive direction, and we just need to maximize the, the, the investment in getting that message over and used, and then the resulting implementation somehow, with the financing necessary to do it, of course. That's the other challenge. Thank you. Please. I'm so excited to be here because this is a room and these are arguments and things I hear that really let my heart beat a little bit louder. 
So uh, I was part of the Deutsche Energiewende about 10 years ago when the Energiewende was still okay and not punished by politics about its success. And uh, before, uh, I was part of the Energiewende because my physics career from time to time did not work as I wanted it to work. So now I'm here and back again, very excited, coming to uh, Hanna-Lena Pessonen's argument that uh, going back and forth with laws is a poison for companies, you say it. And I saw this with the Deutsche Energiewende when politics did exactly that. Between 2009 and 2014, I think they killed a whole branch of wonderful companies and I had tear I still have tears in my eyes, you know, I was part of it. And um, now we could have so many solar energy production here in Europe. We could be the number one in the economy, but it was killed by whom and why? So I see in Austria one competitor we have and we are discussing with, which is the Austrian Chamber of Commerce. They are really fighting against all the things that we are talking about here and I'm asking why? Why? It's a big chance for our whole economy to get workplaces, to get, uh, I mean, every energy rich country is wealthy. And if we get, we have enough energy from the sun, we don't need to import anything. Um, and we don't have to cover all everything with solar cells. It's enough if we co cover those areas that are already covered and are not nature anymore. Covering the roofs, covering uh, parking lots, things like that, we have more than enough energy and we can store the energy very well. We knew it since 10, 15, 20 years and um, the, that the prices go down was not a surprise. It follows an, um, a clear uh, exponential curve. The curve is not followed by years but by amount of solar cells produced. This is also something we know since more than 10 years. So my question now, sorry for this long statement. No, the first question is about Austrian Chamber of Commerce. What's the problem? And the second one is, what about Warmmiete? I'm not sure how I can translate this to English. It's working very well in Scandinavian countries. Warmmiete. So we are all knowing the Kaltmiete. So we see the price okay. of. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Does it exist in Scandinavian countries? Yes. And why doesn't it work what here? It? So, right. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the Austrian members here are asked maybe to answer the Austrian Chamber of Commerce questions. What's the term? I can I can uh, comment on it, but but the interesting thing is that you said that um, since 10 years we know that uh, costs come down if you produce more units. Actually, the first application of technological learning unit-based is from right 1930, 38. So that was basically a 30. Was it 30? No, in the 40s, 1940s. This was basically, at that time, Great Britain tried to build many, many ships, so-called liberty ships, and they found out, because it was unaffordable to build all of those ships, then they found out that if they build them a little bit smaller and build many units, at the thousands of thousands units, the cost will fall that much that they can afford it. And then they did that, and actually it really was, was, was following theory. So we know it already 100 years that, that uh, learning follows those exponential curves and that it follows unit scale learning. I don't want to, to, to comment on the Chamber of, of, of Commerce. I, I, I think, I think um, um, uh, we, 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 uh, I, I think we need to think very carefully about solutions for the industry and communicate them. Uh, then you will also have the industry players on board. For me, it is interesting that some of the in some of the industries themselves are much more progressive than the uh, the Chamber of Commerce here. Yeah. So so, um, but uh, but but I think there's a very important player that you want to have on board. Hanna, you have some comments? Yes. Uh, first of all, the Chamber of Commerce, Austrian Chamber of Commerce. Sorry to hear hear that because. Uh, chamber of Commerce can be really power, powerful players, and, and in some other countries, uh, they have taken a different different role. 
if I understood correctly what you referred to in Scandinavia, you were talking about smart, smart metering. Mm. No, no, what was the, the term you were using? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Could you maybe repeat well, because I'm not sure everyone could understand what he was referring to, Hannah? Uh, Getting the price for the heat directly reading off, or what was the? Yeah. The, yeah, that's true. Uh, in, in, um, if you are renting an apartment, uh, anyhow, the, the owner of the apartment pays for the heating and, and then passes no. it on as part of the, mm -hmm. the rent or separately. However, that thing goes, that's, that's up to, okay. to the so I can I, for, for Norway, okay. I can say that this is, this is not true. I, I rent and I pay the electricity myself. So everything is on electricity. Right, so I heat with electricity, well then, yeah. and everybody. So and, and I pay the electricity. So the, but that is everything is run on electricity. Yeah. So that's why I pay a, I, I, it's probably a cult meter, and then I pay on top. I have my mm. own individual electricity contract, but which actually responds to hourly spot prices, right? So I adjust my behavior. I get a text message, and um, you know it's going to be expensive tomorrow, and I'm not going to do certain things. But ju just to be clear, there has been for a long time a concern about the fact that the investment in energy efficiency has to be made by the owner of the building normally, mm -hmm. and the tenant who pays the rent is the one who benefits. So this splitting of the responsibility and the benefits has been a classical problem. And I see the option of having a requirement that the building owner should pay the heating bill uh, and then the rent somehow is paid for everything as being a small step in a positive direction. But it doesn't stop the landlord increasing his rent, I suppose, to increase, to, to, to compensate for what he's paying for the energy. So there has to be a little bit more than just uh, transferring the, the responsibility. Otherwise, I think the benefits will still not really accrue in the way that, personally, I would like to see it, which would be to incentivize the building owner to actually make his building more efficient. Maybe the only solution is to regulate and say that it just has to be more efficient. Thank you. The next generation is the word. Thank you very much for this inter interesting discussion. Um, I was attending uh, a seminar to climate change a few weeks ago from the URV, actually, in Swiss. And uh, we were discussing uh, an idea which I would have, or I would like to hear your opinion on, which I found re really interesting. And it was that instead of letting each country, in, ex in this example in, in Europe, deal with the transition to greener energy uh, individually, to split the responsibility, for instance, to, to uh, let countries uh, use their inv individual local advantages and, or, or they use their potential. For example, um, let southern countries uh, really use uh, the higher potential in solar energy or northern countries uh, use their potential in, in wind energy also to provide for other countries in Europe and to have really this collective plan so that uh, I don't know if you understand what I'm what I'm trying to say um, so that uh, the, the the potential in in these renewable energies can be um, harvested best actually um, is is or how it, how and how far is this kind of thinking already in place and yeah that was okay two minutes two people want to answer first Nevin and then Bill. Uh, well, uh, there are plans, of course, but uh, markets are doing a wonderful job in uh, pushing technologies where they, do, uh, they work the best. I would not agree with the point that uh, wind should only be in the north and not in the south, uh, because then we are going to have uh, Dunkelflaute. Dunkelflaute exists if you uh, or, uh, uh, limit wind only to some area. Uh, Mediterranean wind is very different from North Sea wind. 
That's why we need to have a balance of wind in different parts of Europe, although the wind in Mediterranean is not so good as in the North Sea. Uh, and on the solar side, uh, while uh, it, it, it looks logical to put more solar to the, to the south, um, actually, the difference between insulation between Dubai and Copenhagen is only factor two. There is a lot of solar energy in the north. It just happens only in summertime. Uh, and in summertime, it happens that there is not enough wind. So basically, with putting all the technologies where the markets want them, uh, because of the local conditions, you get the optimal solution. You can, of course, plan that by calculating it, and this is what we are doing with, uh, with models. Uh, but the solution is, again, very much uh, uh, as the plan says. What we need to plan is the grid connections, because this, this takes a ta long time to build, and this has to be done on European level, and it's being done on European level. There is NSOE uh, body that uh, does 10 years plans, TINDUPS, uh, and they're very good. They see what will happen in 2030, that most of our electricity will be wind and solar. Uh, actually, in May uh, uh, this year, wind and solar was already bigger than fossil fuels in Europe, so it's coming. But we need to build lots of grids, yes. Maybe I could just put back my uh, bureaucratic hat. But if you look at the picture across Europe at the moment, you're completely right, Nathan, of course, that the transmission system operators are coordinated now and they work together across the whole of Europe. But at a national level, each member state, including Austria, of course, has to submit uh, a climate and energy plan, national climate and energy plan. And these plans are submitted to Brussels, where little boys run around in circles and do their sums, and they calculate, and they say, when I add all these numbers up, will it meet the European objective of so much renewables and so much energy efficiency? And if it doesn't, then the negotiations between the different countries and the Commission begin to try to work out how we can get to the solution where all the numbers add up to the right number. And what I think is really important is that in the preparation of those national climate and energy plans, the science academies should be involved. You guys should be talking to the people in the government who are producing these plans and helping them to engage and look at these different options that are in front of you. And some of them, I remember at one of our recent meetings, Slovenia in particular, it's working very well that the academy team is actually working closely with the government officials doing it. And as young scientists and older scientists, I think we all have a responsibility to try to get our messages over and to ensure that this process is made to work in the best way possible. Because the plan for Austria cannot be the same as the plan for Portugal. The, the situation is completely different from so many perspectives. It has to be done country by country. Sorry if it's a bit bureaucratic. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I think this was an excellent closing statement for our discussion <laughs> because we're also exactly on time for closing it. So I want to thank all the participants, <coughs> especially I want to thank you for contributing so much. Um, and I want to thank you for coming. And before we leave, there will be some closing statements by President Fassmann and President Van Salas. Please, thanks. <laughs>
uh, we should be precise as possible, but that's hard to, to predict. Um, Annalena, you said stability is so important. Yes, agree. Um, and instability is a poison for industry. Um, and if we have a plan, we should follow the plan. Um, everything is clear, but do we have a plan? Um, a concise, comprehensive plan of this transformation, especially of the industry? Hmm, maybe. Um, the second point I take with me is, you said, who needs help, they should be supported. Um, we need a fair regulation to help poorer households um, by the energy um, transformation. But once again, if, if you would be a politician, then I would ask you, what do you mean um, with poor households? At what level? Um, what conditions? That is a delicate issue. Um, and if you have a threshold or if you have a range, and if you make it not in the right way, then the others one are coming and said, oh, I want to have subsidies as well. So it's good to say it, but it's hard to ful fulfill it. Um, but I'm staying optimistic um, because engineers do always have answers. Um, um, Neva um, Duic, you are an engineer. Yes, <laughs> because every time I listen to your, we have to do first, second, third. Wonderful. Um, and I fully agree um, that communication is so important. Um, Verena, you said um, communication, communication via social media, this is, this is not an, a proper instrument to change something. I have different, different observations. If I go into my neighborhood in my, my, my suburban village and to look how it happens, one, one, one family started to install photovoltaic on the roof. Um, now I'm the last one. <laughs> I have to do it because it was a learning process and every neighbor looks okay. Um, he or she is doing it, I do it. Uh, so my whole surrounded, surrounding now is, is they have all um, photovoltaic installations. So it's, it's communication, it's education, it's, 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 it's copying a specific methods. So there is something going on. Um, um, maybe not enough, um, and I'm sure that there are, let's say, ex excluded parts in society, uh, um, but I would not be too pessimistic. Um, but communication is important. Fourth, we need to change our behavior. Um, Anna Neumann, you said it. That's, that's always a delicate issue in a, in a liberal society. Who is deciding about my behavior? Um, the politicians? Oh my God. Um, I'm, I'm myself independent um, and I don't like that anyone else decide or say what I have to do. So that's, that's not an easy issue, um, changing of behavior in society. If it would be possible in principle, um, because if you are, let's say, middle-aged male or middle-aged female, you have your Weltbild um, and you don't change it so easily. Um, so it's a, it's a delicate political question who has the ability to say to us how we should behave. Another answer would be the market is the answer. Uh, Neva, you said you want to increase the price for diesel or gasoline thrice as uh, high as it is. Um, <laughs> that's very ambitious. Um, but we are reacting to price signals. So the market could be a um, behavior changing system fully agree, or the comfort. Kian Riani, you, you emphasized it. Um, if I have more comfort for the same price um, or for less price, yes, I would be absolutely stupid not to change my behavior. I would do it immediately. So therefore, I'm, I said it in my introduction. If, if an e-mobile is not so costly as it is today, if it's in the same price as my Volkswagen, um, 
then I would change to a E Volkswagen. Why not? I have the same comfort. Um, so comfort, increasing uh, in comfort, could be also a teacher uh, um, or a or a master for a new behavior. My last point I take with me as in geography, I have to calculate uh, what you said. One to two percent of the area of Austria is enough to, um, to, 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 um, to for the whole supply of energy. Um, okay, that's, that's, let's say, my homework. Um, because I'm always a skeptical person, I have to prove if this is right, because it's not much, one to two percent of the whole area of Austria. Um, maybe you have different homeworks taking with you. Um, I found it, it was an interesting panel discussion. I say thank you very much for coming to the Austrian Academy of Science. I hope not for the last time. Uh, we have a lot of interesting um, um, interesting conferences, speeches, lectures. We have only one joint academy per, per, per year. Um, nevertheless, thank you for coming. There is, there is a reception, a small reception, or a very generous reception. I don't know. There is a reception. Yes, I know. Thank you. So for, for all, there is, a, there is a middle generous reception in the aula. Um, and for the panelists, I would ask you, please stay a little bit. We have to make the most important thing in all these events, photos. Yeah, the ESAC delegation should also stay, please, for a photo. Thank you. Mm -hmm.